So, thank you, thank you so much. And it, I think it's uh, well after the last talk, talking about the future of humanity and what it actually means for us to have uh, like the opportunities to modify uh, genes. Coming to another uh, hot topic, um, AI, and we heard it in the last session, it's, it's about education. We need to understand what's happening out there, and I think it's equally important for um, like, uh, different technologies in the natural sciences like um, CRISPR and uh, uh, editing genomes, as it is in AI. So I'm very happy to have here uh, uh, some of uh, the leading um, thinkers and doers, actually, on uh, education and AI. So, um, uh, Megan, uh, you are part of uh, Reactor, and um, Reactor actually succeeded in doing something that is elements of AI. It's a uh, course that actually tries to educate 1% of the population in Finland, and we just heard um, that um, under the, the Finnish um, presidency um, that this course should be translated to all um, European languages. So I think that is something um, we definitely uh, want to hear about uh, a bit. Then we have uh, Richard coming from Squirrel AI, and it's a bit the other way around. It's not about educating AI, it's using AI to educate better. So I'm really happy to have you here um, to hear what you're doing in China and in the US. Um, and then we have uh, Katrina here um, from uh, the uh, Green Party in uh, Bavaria one of um, the members of uh, the Bavarian uh, Parliament and one of the heads of, of the Green Party here. So I'm very happy to discuss with you this topic. Um, my uh, background is, uh, as um, Alex already said, um, coming from Unternehmertum, a leading innovation and entrepreneurship center uh, in Europe, and Applied AI, which um, is uh, the organization together with the uh, DIHK, the um, uh, chamber of, of um, like, uh, yeah, Handwerk, um, to, to actually bring uh, elements of AI to Germany. We translated it to German, um, and there will be the announcement in January that we actually roll it out here um, in Germany as well. So very happy to have you here. Um, before we start with the panel discussion, we have a quick overview about what you are doing um, with Squirrel AI and then um, what you're doing with uh, Reactor and elements of AI. So happy to hand over to you. Sure. Uh, let me get started. So, uh, actually, uh, I probably should just uh, stand there instead of uh, <laughs> sitting. Um, it's an honor to be here and talk about you know, AI and how AI is actually not only being taught, but actually can be used for teaching, right? So that's what my topic today is using artificial intelligence for adaptive education. And so the company that uh, we have uh, it's based in China, in our headquarters in Shanghai. We're the first AI-powered adaptive education provider in the K-12 space in China. And probably also the first commercially uh, scalable one in the world. So currently, uh, our uh, centers, you can see that we have more than 20, actually this number is a little bit old, so we're actually having more than 2,600 learning centers uh, in China, and then uh, more than 600 cities. So our, uh, if you look at our mission, is that we believe that every kid deserves a one-to-one -one type of learning experience that can make the learning much more efficient and effective and also engaging. I mean, that's our whole mission. And we want to use AI to help with that. And actually, we're using an AI plus human coach combined model to do that. So if you look at the whole uh, from an AI, uh, we call the AI tutor plus human coach perspective, there are really five different steps for you to achieve that, right? So if you think about, if you want to do a one-to-one -one education, first you have to know what this kid is different from the other kid and where they're different. So we call that the first stage is diagnosis, right? So you need to really understand what they know and what they don't know. And then you deliver adaptive instruction, both in sequence and also in content 
to them accordingly. And then, basing on what the student can do and what they cannot do, you give them dynamic feedback and comments and remediation. And then also, there are the higher stage of using AI and a human coach together. It's also help them to collaborate better and to motivate them better, right? But so currently, if you look at this spectrum, the AI is really good with the first two. It's getting there on the uh, step three, but it's still a little bit behind on collaboration and motivation step four and five, right? So this is the kind of like the different stages of using AI. So I'm going to show you a little bit of what is the, are the AIs involved in these whole steps, right? So if you look at it, the first step, if you look at the left corner, when you try to understand what a student know and they don't know, it's almost like you have to basically understand where they are coming from. So we keep track of every student starting every event they have gone through in our, we call it intelligent learning environment, and we capture all the actions they have already accomplished and the result of all those actions. And also we look at other factors, we call the multimodal uh, factors, like look at whether they're paying attention and also what their historical preferences or need so that we can build this we call learner model and really understand where they are on their learning journey, right? So that's really the key for the diagnosis part of it. And that involves a lot of AI in there. Some of them are machine learning, some of them are traditional data science, statistical method, and some of them are a combination of human uh, expert type of advice and the original you know, data building part of it. So, but once you have that diagnosis, that gives you a basis to give the recommendation. It's like a GPS system. Once you can know where the car is, you can navigate them, right? So that we have that pinpoint accuracy in understanding where the student is in their learning journey. And the next step is recommendation. A recommendation requires the, you have to understand like a map, right? Where they're going, where they have been, and that we call the knowledge graph-based path optimization algorithm. And then after that, you can build the collaboration, you can build the feedback, and build all the other part. So I'm not going to delve into the details of how this algorithm are done, but I want to show you kind of like these quick steps, right? So you build goals, you understand the goals, and then build the pathway, and then you have the, all the interface to enable all this whole process. So the partners that we have in order to build this one include some of the best institutions in the world, uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, you know, NSF, uh, and a lot of these top institutions that are helping us to achieve this one. And we definitely want to further advance that with all the public and also all the other partners we can fund. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So. Oh, I think there is uh, a lot of uh, topics we can discuss, but I think it's always impressive to see these numbers, 150 million US dollars in funding, 2 million people and, and students to educate. So it's really impressive what you're doing and uh, a lot of things to talk about. But um, first of all, what about Reactor and yes. what you're doing? Thank you. Um, I'll just stand over to the side here as well, just a little bit easier. So I, uh, I talked today about rethinking education because I think it's a good way of kind of thinking about um, what elements of AI actually achieved and, and, and how we did it. Um, elements of AI is a course that was built between Reactor, which is a technology consultancy for sort of all things future. We have about 550 employees and five offices around the world. For our clients, we typically help them with uh, any kind of technology solution or things that they need to build, everything from data science to, to future thinking to, to web services. And the University of Helsinki is the oldest university in Finland. And we came together and we said, what if we made a course um, that would actually be aimed at everyone? 
because we thought that if AI is like electricity and it's going to affect all of our lives in ways that we're only now starting to imagine, then it shouldn't be left in the hands of a few elite coders. So how do we actually face that? What we ended up building was an AI course that really was meant for everyone. This meant, from our perspective at Reactor, we were not educators. So we didn't come with any kind of preconceived notions from traditional education. We just build beautiful technology products, and we thought that we could apply that to this field as well. It meant a UI that was really intuitive and copy and design that's very inviting and approachable. The copywriting itself is actually very conversational. And we worked every step along the way with Professor Temu Rus from the University of Helsinki, and we were able to form an actually really agile team, working really autonomously the same way that we would to build products. So this is something that's dramatically different than, than the way that traditional education operates, and that's really what informed this project. The course itself is in six components. It uh, is meant for everyone, so people that have a high school education. We actually tested the course out on, on high school students, um, and even for people that don't know how to code. So this is an introductory course to give people a foundational knowledge on the basics of AI so that they could approach the subject with a common language, a foundation of knowledge to help them have a discourse as, as voters and consumers and and uh, consumers of online media and, and, and workers and, and entrepreneurs. So it goes from the definition of what is AI and how there isn't actually any real agreed upon definition. It talks about four different dif uh, types of AI that uh, are in increasing complexity. And then at the end, when you learn about those, it talks about the implications, both personally, for your job, and for the wider society and economy. We decided that when the course came out that we were on a mission to empower people and not make them threatened about AI. This was informed by the fact that when we were creating the course, we actually had focus groups of real people from different demographics across society. and We asked them how they felt about the subject. They said it was intimidating, it was confusing. There was so much inform information and misinformation, they didn't even know where to start. And that was the basis that informed how we created the course. The course itself, when it was released, um, we did a lot of work trying to get it out into the hands of real people. We now have over 340,000 students around the world, uh, but most importantly for us, over 40% of our students are women. And in the Nordic countries, we actually have over 50% of students as women. And that's uh, over almost three times as much as any other computer science course online. Our students at our one-year anniversary ranked us the number one computer science course on Class Central, which is the trust pilot. Thank you. <laughs> it is the, uh, it's sort of like the trust pilot for online courses. Now, full disclosure, we are actually number two in the world right now. We're actually uh, number two, and the number one course is a course on AI and music. So that's really telling you something about the way that people are starting to explore this subject. The OECD has listed elements of AI as one of the reasons that Finland is going to succeed in the 21st century. And that's because they see it as a society-wide experiment that's actually reaching real people and empowering them to take agency in their lives, both in their own education and in the way that they approach the world. We've been cited now and featured in over 500 media outlets around the world, and the story again and again is Finland, Finland's success, Finland's experiments. They're highlighting things like these grassroots movements that are cropping up organically around the country. We were approached by a smart prison project to make this happen, and that's something that is really doubling down on the inclusivity. The CEO of Google told the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Finland that he wants this to be a template for other countries to use. Emmanuel Macron said that Finland has shown the path and urged the EU Commission to set up this goal for the whole European population. We started out with a goal to educate 1% of Finland's population on the basics of AI. We now, in my team, are working to make that a reality for 1% of the world. We're starting with Europe, but we're also forming partnerships with countries around the world, including Latin America and Southeast Asia and North America. Specifically speaking of Europe, the announcement uh, that was made just before the, the Christmas break in Brussels. So the Finnish office of the EU presidency of the European Council uh, has given elements of AI as a gift uh, to the rest of Europe. So we are working with the Euro e uh, EU DG to translate this into all official European languages. And this will be free to all citizens in Europe. And my team back in Helsinki is working very hard now on forming partnerships in each EU country that this will roll out in, with the government, 
with organizations and with universities, because we don't want to just put something online. Nobody's going to care about it. We need to get this in front of real people, and we work with people locally on the ground to make that stick. What's next for us at Reactor Education? Our next big project is another one with the University of Helsinki. We're making a SQL course called Building AI. It's going to help people start learning how to build machine learning models. But what's important about this is that it's going to come in three parts. One for people who don't code, one for people who are learning, and one for people who know Python. And what that's going to do is part of our core ethos. It's lowering the barrier to entry of very intimidating subjects that people feel left out of. It's because the more people that get involved and the more diverse the kind of mindset that we have in these fields, the better they are for everyone. We're doing other courses now along the same uh, bends. So we've actually just launched our, our, our next course with, with other collaborators that are listed here on uh, entrepreneurship. So we launched this at Slush in 2019. It's called Starting Up, and it's uh, about the basics of entrepreneurship, with the premise being that in the 21st century, it shouldn't be about who you know and how much money you have to start a business. It should be about your idea. And that's really kind of... Uh, how we're going forward. We have several course commissions that are going to be coming out all this year, so watch this space. But everything that we want to do going forward um, with my team at, at Reactor Education is to empower all people to participate in our rapidly evolving economy and to focus on how we can actually make that happen for society. Thank you. So again, pretty impressive, I think. God, it's, we need to understand what we actually have in Europe as assets and actually share and distribute them. So um, maybe coming to you, uh, Katrina. So um, if, we, if we now see what um, Squirrel AI is doing as a company, what Reactor is doing with Finland, um, what is the status in, in Germany? I mean, we are a, a population um, doing invention, so we, we need to have a good education here. Yeah. Um, Tell me a bit about what's happening yeah. in, in the politics, how we, do we think about what, um, what should happen or what is happening in Germany. Yeah. I think we still have a way to go in Germany, because if you're looking at different studies, you always find that Germany is in the middle, if you're talking about the digital education. And um, I, for me, education is the key to uh, get people, to, uh, to empower people, to be critical thinkers in a rapidly changing world. And I think it's the job of politics, it's the job of public, it's the job of government to put the infrastructure and the edu educational system right so that everybody in our society can participate and in this educational system and get stronger out of it than they get into it. So, and if I'm looking at Germany and Bavaria where I can have a, a big insight, I'm always kind of smiling and um, pulling my eyes, because if you're talking about all these great classes, I have to tell you, at some places in Bavaria, we don't even have Wi-Fi in schools or right internet. So I think the first point is to have a good infrastructure, and that's the job of politics to um, establish in our country so that everybody can participate. That's the first thing. And the th second thing, which I think is uh, also critical, just to have a good technology or lots of technology in the classroom or new nice apps and everything does not make you automatically, automatically a digital, well-educated person. So I think we have to invest a lot also in teachers, in university professors, in, in um, IT system that not the math or physics teacher is now responsible if the laptop is not working, you know? Um, we have to train the trainers that they are also um, well-educated in this digital work, uh, world and can help then, on the other hand, all the others who want to learn. So I'm also a big fan. I don't think that we're getting better if you're just gi giving everybody an iPad and say, just swipe around. You also need the um, educational backgrounds. And for that, we have to educate our educators, maybe sometimes in a little bit different way. <laughs> maybe as a follow-up question, because what, what you said, Richard, is that you have your learning centers. Um, you have an online platform to learn from. So, why don't we just forget about the existing 
uh, education system and build a new one right next to it and say, well, we just need to rely on digital tools. We, uh, we build new learning centers. We totally rethink how we actually educate people. Do you think that's the way to go also? Or would you actually say, well, no, we, we invest time and money to actually upgrade our existing system? I would like to upgrade our existing, uh, existing system because if you're honest, we're having a pretty good educational system in Germany. And I think uh, at, one, at certain points, we have to speed up. Um, as I said, infrastructure, teachers, educational system, also taking the big advantages of digital uh, learning platforms so that, P, uh, so that we can uh, help kids to um, get them to the point where they need more help in one thing and another thing, maybe they are faster so they can go on there in a faster way. But um, I'm pretty happy that I'm living in a, a country where my education is free, where it's not depending on how many money my parents are having so that I could have a good education at good universities. So I'm a big defender of the system, but I want to upgrade it and I think we have to be faster. That's really important. And for that, uh, and this is also nice for that, this is the responsibility of politics, of the government, to see what is the future bringing, what are other countries already doing, and how we have to speed up. And then I think this is a good combination, and uh, then we are looking in a really bright future. If we talk about learning from um, another, um, Megan, you said that 40% are women in, in your courses. I mean, in every country we have the efforts in actually increasing um, women in STEM, um, subjects. How did you do it? So how did you succeed and actually have such a high number of women participating in your courses? I mean, we, we approached it uh, as a sort of desi design thinking exercise. So if the goal was to specifically target people that are typically left out of technology discussions, uh, that really informed everything about it. So th this was uh, the, the focus groups that we had. So we had uh, test groups of people that we wanted to reach. Um, and we were listening to the kinds of things that they were saying, like I mentioned that it was uh, you know, an intimidating subject or that they thought that robots were going to take over their jobs. And that really informed everything from the graphics to the way that we talk about the subject itself. Uh, and we just tried to make it as, uh, as friendly and approachable as possible. And all the messaging uh, that we used as well was really empowering and encouraging. It was about giving people agency and, and, and kind of like this handout that made them feel like, yes, this is for me too. Mm -hmm. That was something that was really most striking in the focus groups was when people said, I don't feel that this is for people like me. And, and uh, you know, that, that kind of, that really in, informed the way, that, uh, the way that we built out. I particularly like that you or Finland actually said, we actually want to educate 1% of the population. I don't know who of you um, have uh, participated in the session before um, around um, AI in, uh, around the world. And um, the outcome was actually we need to have visions in Europe. Um, we need to think of what we are adding as, as Europe. And that cannot be something that is in the US and then something that is in China. We cannot compete against them. But we need to think about what we are adding. And adding that 1% of the population is actually educated in this technology is something very valuable. And I think that's the way to go forward. I'm very happy that we actually now um, use uh, the same vision also in other countries um, to, to really educate people. And you have another vision. You say your vision is that everyone should get a one-to-one -one education um, and everyone deserves the best possible education on like, their individual skills. And um, you presented some slides, and like as a German, um, you actually read diagnostics of the skills of the people in the current situation. Like everyone is, I don't want to be diagnosed by an AI and um, share potentially my data and, and so on. So, do you see cultural differences in the way of people think about education? And maybe one-to-one -one education is a very valuable goal that maybe functions only in uh, China, or maybe you, you told us um, all about your partners in, in many um, U US um, universities, actually. Um, but there was no one in, in Europe. Do you, do you see that's totally different in, in Europe and in our culture? Or would you see that as a universal setting once people experience what this is actually helping them? Yeah, there are actually, I think there's many factors in terms of differences. A cultural factor is one of them, but I don't think that's the determining factor. I think the need 
to have personalized education that is efficient is a universal need. I do see that it's happening everywhere, but in terms of infrastructure, I'm not talking about just the physical infrastructure, but also the virtual infrastructure, like laws, like the way, like GDPR, like other, you know, how the AI can be used, can be experimented. So there's a lot of these other infrastructure issues. Some of them are culturally related, but some of them are really country by country. Like for example, in earlier, like the talk that Jamie talking about, right? The guy who、uh, created the first genetic modified baby in China, the professor,、uh, he was、uh, put in jail because he breached. Well, he is not a practicing physician or、uh, you know a doctor, so he break the law and he is put in prison for three years for. The experiment that he did on the GM babies, right? And that is very draconian in Ch- China. That's something that's very, very culturally sensitive. I guess the government doesn't like the way that people start to play God, and then put him in jail. And and I think that is probably not going to happen here. You know, the same way, it's probably that experiment it will not even happen in the first place. You cannot even go through the, all the procedures. Like when we did experiment, when we're doing that with a lot of the U.S.-based institution and so forth, we couldn't claim, you know, collect all the data, right? Because there are so many restraints on what data you can collect and what are the type of、uh, compliance you have to follow. But in China, it's a lot easier. So it's a lot easier to conduct experiment and a lot easier to,、uh, you know, get the data for the training of the AI algorithms and so forth. So there's definitely those differences that make a huge impact in terms of how this thing can be invented. But I think more importantly is the business model, right? Where does the value of AI can be amplified? That is, I think, the bigger question. Is that because in China the reason that this thing flies in China is that China are lack of good teachers. China has huge population. The teacher to student ratio is very very high, so the, for the even for the best of students, they don't have the face time or the interaction with teachers, not alone good teachers.、Mm. So there's a huge need to have some technology that can fulfill that gap.、Mm. But in Finland or in Germany, you already have great teachers, and the fundamental the K to twelve you know system is very solid already. So it will be less a need for people to say, "I need to pay for additional one-on-one tutoring time with this combined human coach and、uh, you know AI tutor, right?" So that's where a lot of these. So the business model is very different because the value proposition could be very different. But I think there's definitely a lot of cultural-related、mm. issues、mm. that are in play here.、Mm. Okay, I just like. Said, I mean, for me, education is not a business model. Maybe we're just having kind of different、uh, approaches here because I mean, I'm I'm happy about new ideas, new platform, which are helping in learning because I think this is pretty great. Great that we are taking new technologies for different learning models or、um, uh, getting. The things which we want to educate in another way, but、um, for me, in, in, in my point of view, it's important that the education is available first of all for everybody, and that it's the best we can manage to give. Because I mean, going through education is transforming you not only into an adult,、um, but also as a, in, in a citizen of our society. And so for me, not only. Learning math and physics and English and all this, but also becoming a citizen of、uh, the,、um, of our society, becoming a,、um, a democratic person, and all that is also really important. And this also has to be educated. So、um, yeah, that's just my two but, cents. But, but, <laughs> but should we then, if, if that's kind of a Like basic right to have good education, it, it shouldn't we then really think about using the best available online course for computer science?、Yeah. Shouldn't we take the best individual coaching for each and every one to actually enable people to get the best education? Yeah, as I said, I mean,、um, I'm always open to new ideas, new platforms. But as I said before as well, 
it's just my uh, point of view. I don't think that te te technology and apps alone is making me the well best educators person. So I, I think the interaction, somebody who is having like educational skills as well, and somebody who knows what's in these apps and platforms and then maybe can help the student or the elderly people are also really important. So I don't want to make something about it. It's either that or either that. I think it's important like to, to, to put that together. And then, I mean, I'm having the political head on here. So I, for me, the question is, what do we want as a society? What do we want to pay? What kind of infrastructure do we have to give uh, for the society? And what are our values in forming a good, um, um, in a good educational system? And I think there we are sometimes lacking in some parts a little bit behind. So it's good to have this discussion, to see what other countries are doing, but then of course we have to find our way of how we want to do it as well, and uh, this has to be discussed. And but these, are, these are precisely some of the reasons that we made this course, educating people about the basics of AI, right? Because I think the reason your, your question was sort of leading towards these, these cultural differences between what is maybe considered, uh, you know, uh, totally fine in China, whereas you know, Europe, which produces something like GDPR, is, is based on the fact that people should at least have this kind of control over themselves and their identity and the kind of data that they're putting out there. So it's about the implications and fully understanding the implications of what you're doing. So it's, you know, you can say that, you know, you have um, AI that's measuring different types of things like your emotion when you're looking at a screen or your certain responses. As long as you have an idea of, you know, the outcome from those al algorithms ethically and what, you, what your data is going towards and what is actually the result of it and why. I mean, there's other similar things that are going on right now in the States. There's these companies that are doing recruitment platforms where instead of having a job interview with human beings, companies, I don't want to name any names, but large multinational companies are outsourcing these to video interviews that are being completely done by by, a, by AI, and there's, there's, uh, there's the candidates who actually don't go forward in these job interviews, these videos are monitoring their emotions, their tone of voice, the words that they're using, and the only thing that these companies are saying is that it's based on the model of success inside the company. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask, you know, what, what those, those models of success, are they predominantly white middle-aged men because these are large banks and companies like that? So how, if it's trained on the, previous, on the current employees who are successful in their role, how can it, you know, how can it be unbiased? But then, you know, I've read a re articles in the Washington Post that say from these companies that computers aren't, computers aren't biased, people are, therefore our product isn't biased. And if you take a course like ours, you understand that that is so fundamentally the opposite of how AI works. The data sets that you use inform the machine learning models. And if the data sets that are only representative of a certain group are being fed into the model, then it's actually reinforcing the bias, let alone taking it away. These are the kinds of things that I think educating like what AI is and how it works is important with the course so that people have that kind of agency to make decisions. So it is a very interesting and very relevant topic. Sadly, we are already at the end <laughs> of our session. Um, so um, I think what we actually can do, like if you say we need to educate at least 1% of our population, I think we should add something and it is as soon as possible because you say yeah. the technology is out there and if we now discuss for the next couple of years how we can actually do it, then we already lose a couple of years. So mm -hmm. for me, I would say by 20, end of 2020, we already have 1% of the population and then it suddenly um, increases um, with uh, the next couple of years um, to really have an educated um, population. I think you're totally right that this is the most important topic. So thank you very much for being on stage. Um, I would have liked to talk much longer with you, but um, you're all around. Um, so if you have any questions, I think we're all uh, here and you can happily approach us. Thank you thank so much. You.